Okay, well, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the SigmaSoft introductory webinar. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. So my name is Fred Phillips, and today we're going to go through an intro introduction presentation of the SigmaSoft injection molding simulation software. And really, the, the, the goal today is just to give you really a high-level view of some of the, the basic capabilities of SigmaSoft and also some of the unique uh, capabilities uh, as they compare to, say, other uh, simulation softwares that are on the market today. I think most people that have registered for today's webinar have a basic understanding of injection molding simulation software. So I put together some slides that uh, will kind of highlight some things you may have not may not have seen in simulation. So uh, before we get started, so just a little bit about myself. So I uh, have a plastics engineering degree from Penn State, uh, graduated in the late 90s, and really have spent my entire career uh, in flow simulation. So I started out as an application engineer uh, with Seamold, uh, which is an injection molding simulation company uh, that was a direct competitor with Moldflow back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Moldflow purchased Seamold in the year 2000 and, of course, uh, purchased me. So I continued my career with Moldflow uh, as an engineer as well for a few more years and then uh, eventually moved over into more of a sales-related role. And, uh, and basically until about last year, I stayed with Moldflow, which then became Autodesk. And then I uh, decided to uh, move my career out west, uh, so I relocated out here to Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, also um, took a job with Sigma uh, Plastic Services, uh, which is, of course, uh, the makers and sellers of the Sigma Soft injection molding software. So, Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and, and get into the presentation here. Uh, we have all the lines muted, and what we'll do is at the end we'll take questions. Uh, so uh, during the pr uh, presentation. If you think of anything, just you know, jot it down, and then at the end, we'll, uh, we'll answer the questions one by one. Okay, so I'm just going to start out here about, and talk about the company a little bit. And, and I realize that a lot of people, uh, the SigmaSoft name is, is fairly new to a lot of people in the, in the plastic rubber market. And, uh, and mainly that's because you know, a lot of the, the technology, although seems new to the U.S., the technology is actually over 20 years old. So for most of the time, Magma Engineering, uh, based out of Germany, uh, was the industry leader for die-cast simulation software. Um, so all, during all that time, had established a very robust um, 3D uh, element technology for simulation. Um, of course, very focused on thermal aspects, being that it was a metal world uh, and so forth. And then in 1998, um, decided to take that technology and spin it out um, to also uh, develop a, a polymer uh, simulation package, uh, which is, of course is called SigmaSoft. So, and really that technology has made it to the United States or North America in the last, uh, say, five to seven, eight years. And uh, so what you see now is um, uh, SigmaSoft, uh, which we have a North American headquarters up in Schaumburg, Illinois. And as I mentioned, I'm based in Phoenix, Arizona and, and focused mainly on the Western United States. Okay, so uh, today uh, we are a privately owned company with global sales and support. Um, you can see from some of the bullet points on the screen, um, you know, number of employees and software development, um, but everything's developed and centralized in Germany. Uh, so uh, we, of course, work with them direct um, on, the, on the software itself and, uh, and then really sell and support it here in the United States and uh, Mexico and Canada. So our primary goal here is to offer the easiest to use simulation software that is also extremely accurate. And those are two things that I'm going to go through today um, because uh, I have a lot of experience in simulation. And those, of course, are, are two things that maybe have prevented a lot of people from uh, employing or implementing uh, injection molding uh, software in their company up until, say, today. OK, so I mentioned our worldwide presence. And uh, here's just a, a quick map of, of the different uh, locations. And again, again, you know, the North American location. So these are our primary offices for Magma or Sigma. And then, of course, we have a number of the sales and engineering people in the field. Um, of course, I'm located in, in Arizona. You don't see that on the map. And, on, and here at the bottom, you can see all the different countries and locations where we have uh, representatives throughout the world. OK, and then, of course, just a quick snapshot of you know, who's using SigmaSoft. So here's just some, some big company names that you probably mostly would recognize. Uh, and, and you can see that, and the point here, too, is that it's, you know, it's polymer, it's plastics, right? So uh, we're not dedicated to any particular industry. Uh, being plastic, you know, we can really spread through automotive, medical, uh, consumer products, uh, of course, a lot of you know, custom molders, and tool shops, and so forth, and even material suppliers. OK, so 
Before we get into the technology, of course, I like to go through the whole idea of why, why would a company want to implement simulation in the first place. So if we look at the map, you know, if we look at the, the, the art to part process that a typical company would go through, you have your initial conceptual design, you know, part design and, and some sort of probably 3D CAD package. And then eventually that, that design becomes real and then uh, an injection molding tool is created uh, to actually manufacture that part. And then once that mold is built, then it's put into production. And of course, that's, uh, you know, that's the entire process. Now, uh, if you look at the, the cost here, now anything you can do up front in the part design or mold design phases uh, to optimize anything, make any changes, solidify any type of, you know, what the cooling system is going to look like, what the runner system is going to look like, the cavitation, the gate location, wall thicknesses, material selection, you know, all of that. The sooner you, that can be done up front, um, it's a lot easier to make those changes on the computer um, than to actually make it in the real world on an actual tool. You know, once you start pulling that tool out of manufacturing or making changes on the actual physical tool, uh, that's really where it gets expensive. And that's really where the true value of simulation lies, is being able to do a lot of this in a virtual world and run many scenarios, iterations. And then once you have the right combination of material process, tooling, uh, and so forth, then go ahead and, uh, and put it into production and uh, should save a lot of money that way. And of course on the screen you can see you know, many of the different areas uh, that the, the savings can be achieved, right? So material weight, that's an obvious one. You know, if obviously people want to make the part as thin as possible, but also manufacturable and able to withstand the structural uh, integrity or what the part is designed for. Can it withstand the load or the real world application? Um, cycle time, of course, hey, the faster you can make parts, uh, the more money you're going to make, right? So even shaving, you know, one second off of your overall cycle time, you know, if you're making a million parts, um, you know, that could be a tremendous savings. Um, tooling costs, of course, tooling rework. Again, that goes back to, you know, anything we can do up front is going to reduce the physical tooling costs or rework that's going to occur. And, of course, the resulting scrap or downtime that would be uh, a result of that. And then some other items on the right side. I won't go through them all, but one thing I also like to talk about is it's, it's a really good tool for communication. And I think in this industry today, communication is very important, um, particularly in the, in, the, in the plastics industry, because it's very rare that you would actually be doing everything under one roof. It's very typical that somebody will be designing the part, and then the mold might be built in China, for example, but the part might be designed in Ohio, and then it might be manufactured even in a third location. So you have a lot of different people that have their hands into the success of this final product. And simulation is one of those tools that allows you to share through all those different areas um, through the entire process, you know, what's going to happen or what might happen, or if there is an issue, you can even troubleshoot backwards using simulation. Okay, so let's go through the technology overview here. I'm just going to quickly... Uh, look over and make sure uh, we don't have any uh, issues with uh, the webinar. It looks like uh, you guys can see my screen okay and you can hear me okay. Okay. Okay, so first is uh, the idea here is that we can simulate all types of polymers. So whether it's thermoplastic, thermosets, or any combination of those that, that, that fall into the elastomer family. So, uh, you know, a thermoplastic elastomer or a curing elastomer such as an LSR. Um, you know, very strong in those areas as well. And, and, or any moldy component combination. So, you know, you might have a thermoplastic that's being overmolded with an elastomer, you know, very popular today with you know, toothbrush handles and screwdriver handles, you know, soft grip type applications where you have more than one uh, polymer uh, that, that comprise of the, the final part. And then the other uh, items here below, so if we look at, you know, the, the ability to consider the entire mold. So this animation that ran on the, the right is just kind of a, a quick animation generated from the software. So the idea here is that you have the ability to import your entire mold design and take into account all of those components in the simulation. So um, you may just want to bring in your part geometry only and put a runner system on it or even a gate and then just run it from there to see if it's even manufacturable, uh, which is usually where most people would start early in the process. But as you start going through the actual mold design and mold, uh, get towards mold, more the mold build part of it, you have the ability to bring in all those different you know, 3D mold components and consider them in the analysis. And this, can, this can become very valuable, especially when you have different mold materials that are going to exhibit different heat transfers between uh, the different steels, for example. So you have the ability to do that. Um, also, multi-cycle simulation. So one of the very unique capabilities with our software is the ability to do multiple cycles. And so we'll talk about that today and the value of that. And, uh, and another thing I always like to talk about, and me being with the company for about a year now, this is probably one of the most obvious and glaring differences that I've seen with SigmaSoft compared to other packages I've used, 
is there's no time-consuming or costly mesh preparation. So you're, you're able to run a very high-end, detailed analysis, um, and there's still a very complex mesh behind it. But the process of going through and creating that mesh is very simple. It's based on our mesh uh, technique, which I'll go through in one of the next slides. Um, but the idea here is that you don't have to have, to have to be a mesh expert or um, some sort of an analyst who's done this for you know months, years to really get good at creating a say a simulation mesh, you know, simulation ready mesh model. And you can really take any CAD model, bring it in, and, and within no time you're ready to run analysis, which is what most people want. It really opens the uh, the door to you know everybody involved in the process, you know, project engineers, project managers, tooling uh, engineers, process people. I mean, all those people can come in and use the software and don't need to be a you know a CAD jockey or, or a, an analyst expert meshing guy. And then I mentioned the highly developed and accurate thermal solvers, so we can touch on some of that as well in the, in the presentation. And then lastly, the crystallization and stress prediction. Uh, the ability to capitalize crystallization is one huge advantage, and then also the ability to, to look at stress prediction during and after the molding cycle. So SigmaSoft is the only simulation package uh, in the world that actually allows you to see what's going to happen after the part ejects. And, uh, and again, we'll talk about that and how that really takes it to the next level in terms of accuracy. Okay, so we'll go through the breadth of capabilities here, and uh, this is a pretty busy slide, but it, it kind of shows at least the different components of the software. So if we just start at the top and look at our CAD interface and meshing, so of course, first we have to start with some sort of CAD model, right? So that's the first requirement with SigmaSoft is you need a 3D CAD model, and it could be just with a part like I mentioned, or it could be the actual mold base itself, and we can take the part from that. Uh, there, there are various options there. We can bring in multiple formats, so you can bring in uh, STL files, STEP files, uh, SAT files, and even uh, native, uh, a couple native CAD files. So once that is imported into the software, uh, you know you go through the quick meshing, which I, which we'll talk about, and then it's really at that point you determine what you want to do in the software. So most people, of course, would do the flow analysis, which is going to be your filling and packing, uh, you know, phases of injection molding. And, uh, you know, and again, the ability to consider, consider crystallization and then look at you know, things like sink marks, uh, voids, venting, uh, and so forth, which we'll also touch on. And then the thermal analysis, really, which is the cooling aspect of it, right? So, um, you know, looking at how the, the polymer cools over time, but also the ability to put in, uh, you know, the cooling lines and see how your cooling design is impacting the heat transfer in and out of the tool. And also, you know, any type of maybe highly conductive inserts. For example, if you want to put, say, a beryllium copper insert into a, into a deep core and see if that's going to make a difference versus, say, just a, a standard P20 core, um, those capabilities, of course, would, would be very valuable to learn in a virtual world before you actually do it in the real world. And then shrinkage and warpage analysis. So this is our stress shrinkage warpage. It's going to show you the, the final part um, deflection. You know, so what, what the part's going to look like once it's ejected from the machine, how much is it warping, how much did it shrink, uh, what kind of stresses are in the part that may be of concern when it's actually in its application. And then, uh, and then we go over, we also have the ability to do ejection simulation. So um, again, another unique thing with SigmaSoft um, is the ability to simulate the actual ejection portion of, of the phase to see if your ejection design is impacting you know, the, the part in any negative way, you know, is, uh, is the ejection the so ejector pin deforming the part, uh, and you know, some or putting some sort of uh, unneeded stress or pressure into the part. Um, the ability to simulate that, and then lastly, the post molding I mentioned. So, um, once the part's ejected, it continues to cool, right? You know, it's it's not completely at room temperature, ambient temperature. So, being able to capture you know further cooling, crystallization, and stress relaxation from when the part is ejected out of the, the, the mold to, say, maybe an hour or two hours after while it's sitting on the table or it's you know, on that conveyor belt, um, very important. And then also the ability to do a, a second heating or cooling cycle. So maybe you might want to anneal the part or quench the part after ejection, you know, throw it in an oven or dip it in a, a water bath. And so we can also stimulate that and consider, OK, how would that impact the stresses in the part, the, the final uh, part warpage, and so forth. Okay, so I'm going to start here with the meshing technology. So what we use is called a finite volume method. And really what you're looking at uh, here is we use little cubes or little rectangular elements. It's like a nine-noted uh, element with um, a center, a point of calculation at the center of the, of, the note, of the element. And the idea here is that because, you know, you have an XYZ type situation and there's no there's no situation where you would have overlaps or you'd have to worry about aspect ratios and things like that. And those are the things 
um, in other simulation packages that don't use this type of technique where it becomes a little bit of an issue. And I think it's why a lot of companies over the years have not implemented simulation because you, know, you really had to find somebody that, was, that got really good at mesh cleanup and created a simulation model. Uh, for analysis, and that could take, you know, it could take a day uh, just to create, you know, to clean up a mesh. And then, of course, if you have to go back to the CAD system and make a slight change, bring it back into the software, and now you get to spend another day just to clean up the mesh. And, and nowadays, people just don't have that time. You know, they want to bring it in, get moving. They may have to make a tooling recommendation the next day. So um, it really expedites the, the upfront process. Okay, so now, and also in terms of, of setting it up, it's very straightforward, very much like setting up an injection molding machine, or an injection molding process, I should say, in terms of, you know, you have your, your mold open time, your mold close time, and then you set up things like, you know, okay, your fill time, you can control by flow rate, uh, and then you're, you set up your packing profile, and of course your cooling phase, you know, how long is the part going to be, you know, in, in the mold before it opens, and then, uh, and then other things, okay, so, you know, if you're, if you're, Design has inserts. You can specify the placement of inserts. If there's any type of delay time, you can specify that, even service time. And then one thing I also like to point out, too, is you have the ability, so for each mold component here, so in this example, we have, you know, quite a few different components, you know, say the movable half versus the fixed half. So you can even specify different times uh, that the part is in contact with, say, the movable half versus the fixed half. So, I, again, I think this is another step towards improved accuracy is, you know, once that mold is open, it may be sticking on that movable half for another, you know, one, two, three seconds. So the additional heat transfer is occurring and, and the, the part is still touching the hot mold or cold mold. And being able to account for that just further increases the accuracy. So I always like to say that, you know, we calculate more and assume less. So the more that we can calculate, the closer we can get to reality. And, of course, uh, the more confident you will be in making decisions about the software. Okay, so here's just an example. As I mentioned, you know, if you do have the mold, uh, you have this interaction, of course, between the melt and the mold itself. So in this example, I've actually sliced uh, through the mold, and I'm, I'm injecting the polymer in this uh, ring-shaped design. So you can actually see the polymer flowing around through the cavity, but also the, the, the interaction with the mold itself. So you can see the mold temperature around there is actually increasing as the polymer is being injected. So um, very nice just to show that, that capability of, of capturing that uh, interaction. Okay, so here's just a, a typical filling example. Now, I, I don't like to usually bore too many people with filling examples because, you know, if you've seen one thing in flow simulation, I'm sure it's been a filling example, right? You know, the, the flow pattern. Uh, but, you know, I, I got to show it just to, you know, let people know. In this, in this example, we're actually looking at pressure over time. So we're actually watching the pressure increase through the sprue as it, uh, as it fills the part. Now, but one thing I do want to show, though, is so we can look at the flow front, but what we can also do is look at what happens behind the flow front. So what we have is, is kind of another unique capability is what we call tracer particles. So you can assign these virtual particles, uh, typically, you know, right, say, at your injection location, and then follow them through the entire process, through the filling and packing phases. So it's one thing to watch where the melt front goes, but it's also another important thing to see what happens behind that melt front as polymer continues to flow through those areas. Go ahead and uh, start this animation again. You can see how it redirects there once the, the one side of the cavity is full. Now, this can be very important for things, especially like weld lines. So, if we look at, uh, in this case, the tracer particles um, for these weld lines, you, you can see where they're coming together, but also, you know, where those weld lines are formed is also going to be areas, you know, where the, the polymer continues to flow through those regions. So if we look at this example, and I, I know the cell phone housing looks like it's probably from about 15 years ago, which it probably is, actually. So I always kind of make a joke about this that I probably need to get a better, uh, better example. Um, but I think the point still remains, though, that, you know, any type of design where you have holes like this, right, so you know, calculators or um, remote controls, things like that, you're going to have weld lines because there's no way around it. Um, but the idea, though, is, is that weld line acceptable? So with SigmaSoft, you have the ability, so if we look at that tracer particle uh, capability again, now we actually are watching the, the weld lines form, and then also over time, what continues to happen in those weld line areas. You know, as, as additional polymers push through there, does it strengthen the weld line? Does it weaken the weld line? You know, it's not good enough to just look at where they come together. You have to look at the history of what happens in that area until that polymer completely solidifies. So what we can look at is a plot called weld line strength. So what's happening here is just looking at, you know, the things I just mentioned, and also, okay, so the, the 
the angle at which the flow fronts have come together, uh, the pressure at which they've come together, the temperature at which they've come together, and really taken all those things and evaluate it you know, on a scale from zero to one. You know, how strong is that weld line going to be? Because um, you know you're going to have it. It's just a matter of, you know, is it going to be acceptable? And then, of course, you can make decisions uh, from there. You know, if it's going to be a weak area, then, then you can go back and maybe move the, the gate, uh, you know, put in some sort of flow leader to, to move it around, even an overflow tab. You know, at least it gives you some ideas um, uh, to, to fix it before you actually get into the real world and find out that you have a part that's cracking in the same area every shot. Okay, so here's another example. In this case, we're looking at the venting capabilities within SigmaSoft. So you have the ability to model and vent, and then part of that also is watching the air movement throughout the cavity. So you can look at air through the cavity, but also the air and, and uh, the temperature and pressure um, as it goes through the vent. So in this example, if you follow the red areas, that's actually our air that's being trapped. In this case, it's actually moving through the polymer. In some cases, even being absorbed into the polymer. So here at the end, you can see these red areas right at the top of these ribs. So you know, that's going to be an air trap. So you're probably going to end up with a burn mark there unless you vent that area and get that air out of there. Um, now I'm going to animate it again just to show some of that air. Now you can see here this big red area of air that's moving. It actually moves through the cavity and then end up being, end up, ends up being absorbed slightly. Um, now you typically wouldn't see that with most thermoplastics. I put this example in here because it's kind of neat that in this case it was a very low viscosity elastomer, which flows a lot differently than say a, a normal higher viscosity thermoplastic. Um, so normally those air traps would just freeze immediately, but in this case, this example actually showed the air moving through with this elastomer, which was, was pretty interesting. Okay, so also just a quick example of the jetting gravity effects. Um, and, and, I, and I put some of these in here because you know, they might seem simple or obvious, uh, but you know the, the, the fact remains is that a lot of these things simulation has struggled with over the years you know, to capture things such as jetting you know, based on the element technology. Oops, excuse me. So here in this case you can see the, you know, the jetting as it shoots way down to the bottom of that and then backfills up through the part. Um, pretty interesting example. In this case this was a thermostat. Okay, so I'm going to shift gears here and, and go to the multi-cycle simulation that I mentioned in the beginning. Okay, so what the multi-cycle simulation really does is it allows you to run uh, well, multiple cycles, right? So you can run as many cycles as you want, but the idea is to determine when you actually end up with a heat balance inside the mold or when your mold basically reaches steady state. Uh, so in this case, you know, we ran uh, you know, multiple cycles, and usually you run a few more than you probably would need. In this case, you know, once it starts to flatten off, then you can say, okay, in this case, around 18, you know, around 18 cycle, we kind of see a flattening off and really not a huge increase um, or change in heat balance. So from that point on, we can say, well, okay, it's about 18 cycles. And the beauty of that, though, is not only determining how many cycles, but more importantly, in my opinion, is uh, using that information for the simulation. So if we look at here, the temperature at the start of the cycle, so if we just do cycle one, so if you just ran a simulation just with one cycle, uh, of course, you're going to assign all your temperatures, right? You're going to assign my mold temperature is, uh, is X, my, my coolant temperature is Y, and so forth. And then everything's going to be calculated from that data. Uh, but if we look at uh, cycle five, and then we look at cycle 11 and 12, now cycle 11 and 12 in this example, again, is kind of where, where it leveled off to more of a steady state, you know, not, not a big change from cycle to cycle. So what we're doing is we're using cycle 12 data uh, for the for the actual filling, packing, cooling, warpage, stress stimulation. So we know already okay, that this tin here has gone through 12 cycles of hot polymer, and it's pretty hot. And even these core blocks are pretty hot. And you can see the mold itself from the runner system is heated up. So the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, do you want to use the, the data here from cycle 12 for your important warpage prediction, or would you rather use cycle 1? Of course, you want to use the more accurate data. So again, calculate more, assume less. Okay, so this example here is actually showing a part. I stopped the animation because it moves pretty fast. But you can see we have really a red area and a blue area and then gray, which is the rest of the part. So what we're showing is really our packing efficiency. So all the areas in red or blue are still molten polymer. So any colored area is molten polymer. Now the difference is, is the red area still has packing being applied to it. So there's pressure being applied to that polymer to try to over, you know, overcompensate for the shrinkage, you know, push more polymer into the cavity and so forth. The blue areas have been shut off from, from the packing, uh, from the pressure. 
So they're free to shrink in the mold. So this gives you a really good idea of what's happening in your part um, once the gate freezes or once areas near the gate freeze off and create that uh, isolation of these areas that are now just free to shrink and, and that packing cannot compensate for, for their shrinkage and, and final cooling. Of course, here's, a, here's an example where I took a snapshot pretty much right at gate freeze. So for this part, okay, at gate freeze, I can see that down here on the left side, I have you know a couple areas that were thicker, so they're, they're taking longer to cool. So now it's a concern. Now I might have some sink marks in that area. I might have uh, some voids in that area, additional shrinkage that I probably don't want. Um, and then, of course, you're up at the top, the same idea. So all the blue areas are just free to shrink. So. Of course, it's a good segue into sink marks, right? So we take that same example, and, and of course, you have the correlation here now saying, yep, when I go look at my sink marks, sure enough, it's predicting that those areas are going to deflect um, due to uh, that additional shrinkage. Now, again, as the, as the you know, engineer or uh, analyst for the project, you can say, well, how can I get around this? You know, can I open up the gate? Do I increase the, the melt temperature to try to get more polymer in there so it doesn't freeze off so fast? Is there anything I can do with the design itself? Uh, so again, it gives you a lot of options to, to, to try to fix this on, in a virtual world. And then, of course, the other would be voids. So again, here we have a, a plot that's, that shows you actually the potential for voids. Uh, same idea. And again, you look at this and say, wow, it looks like I might have a pretty good void there. And then you, uh, as the owner of the project, say, okay, is this going to be an issue? And then, of course, what can I do in the software to maybe try to uh, optimize this, eliminate this, reduce this, so forth. Okay, so I'm going to talk about runner balancing here a little bit. And uh, the, the main reason I put this in the presentation is because this question comes up in almost every meeting I, I've ever had over the last 10 years. Um, and and I guess because it's become a big phenomenon in the industry of what's uh, understood as shear-induced imbalances. So if we take a part like this, and, uh, and of course this is the, the, the standard uh, Beaumont you know, plaque that, you know, so if anybody's familiar with Melt Flipper, this is probably what you've seen, and it's rela related to that technology. Uh, so you have a geometrically balanced tool. So in theory, if, if all the cavities are the same exact dimensions, they're all the same distance from the sprue to the cavity, um, all eight, say, eight parts should all be the same, right? They should all be the same volume, the same weight, the same shrinkage, the same flow, and everything. But what happens in reality sometimes is if you get a high shear sensitive material, you end up with something more like this on the right side, you know, where the parts come out like this, and you're thinking, well, that doesn't make any sense. It's, the cavities are balanced geometrically. There must be something going on with the process itself. And sure enough, that's what's, what's called a shear-induced imbalance. So the idea here is that if we cross-section our runner, so in this case, we have what's, we're going to show what's melt dividing. So we're going to cross-section the runner. So we're coming down through, say, our primary runner. Now, in this case, if we look at the cross-section of the runner and just look at, say, temperature or shear. So temperature, shear, and viscosity can all be related, right? So the more shear, the higher the temperature, the lower the viscosity. So we have the highest temperature around the perimeter and then the lowest at the center. Now, because polymers flow in laminates, you know, it's a laminar flowing material, it really flows in layers. So if you actually were to really look at this, you would find I mean, really a lot of layers, an outer layer, then a next inner layer, then another inner layer. Um, which is just fine until you get to a split in the runner system. And because of those laminates, it actually splits in laminates. So what ended up happening is once we go into this secondary runner here, all the, all the hotter material, uh, you know, easier flowing materials on the top side and all the colder material, harder to fill, you know, higher viscosity materials on the bottom. And this becomes even propagated further when you come into another split. So now we split this again, and now we have our hottest material going down one side of the runner system, and then we have our coldest material going down the other side of the runner system. And that really is what leads to a shear-induced imbalance. So those splits in the runner system are dividing that melt. You know, it's melt dividing that's occurring. And then, of course, here in SigmaSoft, you can see we, we actually simulate that. And, and really, that's what I'm leading to is that, so the next question, of course, is everybody always asks, can you simulate this? And for years, it really, it was, it was a hard thing to capture based on some of the, the simulation technology you know, the types of runners that were being used, you know, that didn't capture asymmetry inside of the runner system. Uh, SigmaSoft does an excellent job of this, and uh, so I always like to point that out, that, you know, when I saw Sigma, I thought, well, you know, finally, you know, somebody that can actually predict this accurately, because it, it is a big thing in the industry, and I've seen a lot of people have struggle with this. Then, same idea here, we're just going to cross-section the, uh, the runner system just to show you, you know, what, what it looks like if we take that temperature slice. 
It also shows you that you can do a lot of these, these neat things inside of the software, you know, being able to slice it up and look really at any point within the geometry of what's happening through the thickness at the skin at any time step. Um, so a, a lot of capabilities to let you look at what you want when you want. And here you can see you have that, that crescent moon uh, shape of temperature that's already been occurred by that runner split. Okay, so the next thing would be, uh, just want to talk quickly about our hot runner uh, capabilities. So this is one thing that, uh, that I've learned a lot, of, uh, a lot of our hot runner capabilities um, really are a step above um, what, uh, what else is, is on the market. And it's been realized too by a lot of the hot runner companies now are using SigmaSoft because of these capabilities. And it all goes back to being able to import those mold components that I mentioned in the beginning. So since you have that ability, now the nice thing is you can bring in your entire hot runner manifold and consider everything about it. You know, so bring in you know, the coils, uh, you know, the, the, the heater bands, you know, all those things, and then actually set it up just like a hot runner controller. You know, there's PI controller settings in the software. You can specify the watts, um, max temperature, uh, and, and so forth. So um, just want to point out that um, the hot runner capabilities can be very advanced. Um, if you can bring in the geometry and actually capture it. And another part of that, of course, would be the hot runner heat balance. So being able to look at the different heater bands and, and, and look at their effectiveness and, and thermal couples. So in this case, you know, looking at a graph saying, you know, hey, you know, and Sigma Soft will tell you this, you know, which, which one of your heater pans is, is, is maybe under a great load of, of energy and heat, uh, which ones maybe aren't being used enough. So it just goes back to, you know, design, you know, enabling you to really optimize um, all aspects of your process, and this would include hot runners and, and all the intricacies of a hot runner system, as, as some of you may know. Okay, so let's skip over here to shrinkage and warpage. Okay, so what we have here is just a quick animation showing the part warping. And uh, and again, I, I bet most people on this call, if you've seen simulation, you've probably have at least seen a, you know, a warping prediction. Um, so I just want to talk about this a little bit. So. So within this, of course, you know, what causes warpage, right? So it's, you know, it's non-uniform shrinkage and stresses that, that cause warpage. And when you have areas of the part that, that exhibit these things you know, near each other, so you get one area of high shrinkage, one area of low shrinkage right next to each other, that, you know, those opposite conditions you know, end up you know, warping the part. Um, so in this example here, you can see we have a lot of areas of um, you know, pod, the, the red being you know, tensile uh, stresses, and then we have areas of blue, the compressive stresses. And again, you get those working against each other, and that's going to you know, flip or warp the part uh, the way that, it, that uh, I guess, is most relaxed. So here, if we look at the warpage displacement, so again, you have the ability to, to look at, of course, the, the storage shape and the value, the magnitude of shrinkage, you know, x, y, z. And then here, we even uh, can overlay the, the original design so you get an idea of you know, how much is it warping. And, and a lot of times, you'll, you'll scale it. So there's ability to scale it, you know, say, three times, five times. Sometimes, you know, that way you can at least magnify the areas of concern. You know, with the naked eye, it may be hard to really pinpoint an area that's warping. Uh, so when you magnify it, you know, sometimes it can really help you see those quickly. Okay, so and uh, a couple things here too. So the ability, because of our viscoelastic material model, so again, another unique thing with SigmaSoft is, is if we have viscoelastic material properties, we can actually calculate uh, the shrinkage of the part onto the mold during the molding process. Um, so again, you know, we're, we're capturing something that does happen in the real world. And not only that, but as I mentioned, so also what happens after ejection. And I can't talk enough about this part of the software. Um, I've run some projects, and it seems like uh, and more times than not, you know, a lot of the, the additional uh, warping or shrinking that occurs it happens after the part's ejected. And, and it's nice to, to have some insight into that, show people that, hey, you know, at ejection, this is what it is, but hey, if you wait 20 minutes, it goes further. And, uh, and so you can see here that these capabilities. And then here's an example. So if we look at, uh, say, distortion on this part right at ejection, so we see we have about, about 77 thousandths of a millimeter. But then after just six minutes of cooling, so the part continues to cool, continues to warp, uh, the, uh, the displacement has actually doubled. Uh, so now we're up here to 184 thousandths. And then after one hour, you know, the part, so about one hour the part is completely cooled. You know, everything is solidified. There's no more crystallization or stress relaxing going on. It's pretty much the final part is, is there. And you can see the actual displacement here is 365,000. So that's a big difference from what happened at ejection versus here. So again, you know, this is the important 
part here. This is what you need to make decisions and make adjustments to your process if this is really what the final product is going to look like. And then related to that, so crystallization is one component of that. So here we can look at crystallization at ejection. So very little crystallization has occurred. So you know, there's a lot of cooling that still needs to happen and crystallization. And of course here, you know, it's, it's jumped up significantly, you know, like 82% uh, crystallization versus here, it's almost zero. Okay, so also there's the ability to export results to uh, FEA packages, you know, so a structural analysis package, you know, like your abacuses, Patran, ANSYS, and so forth that you can see here on the list. And this is becoming very popular just in general, and uh, so the, the idea here is that it just makes the prediction more accurate. So you can go into a structural analysis package today um, and say, you know, hey, I have this part, and it's a glass-filled nylon. You just pick glass-filled nylon, and then say, okay, it's going to be maybe constrained here, and the load's going to occur here, and then in you get your basically your, your real-world type scenario uh, situation done. But what you haven't taken into account is the entire process history that that glass-filled nylon has gone through. Uh, and, and as anybody would know that's you know, run polymers, you know, there's a violent history of shear and temperature and pressure that occurs. And especially for fiber film materials, you know, the fiber orientation can be very important, um, especially at weld line areas you know, where the, the fibers may flip up and create a weak area. So being able to take all of that data from simulation read that into the structural analysis and do that same analysis you would, but now you've actually taken into account a realistic part um, that's gone through a manufacturing process, um, so it's just a greater improved accuracy if you can do this. Okay, so I'm going to go through the ejection simulation here. So the idea is, uh, is, is really just what it says. So you, you, you have your ejectors. Now, this isn't required, but some people like to go ahead and put, uh, you know, put the ejector system in and see how it's going to impact the actual part. So we, we can look at deformation of the part due to the ejection, so like here, for example. And then we can also look at things like contact pressure. So even, you know, turn off, you know, some of our geometry components and just look at the pins and say, you know, how much contact pressure do each of our pins go through during the ejection stage? In this case, you can see some pins had hardly any pressure, and then other ones have quite a bit of pressure. So this kind of really allows you to evaluate, you know, do I have too many pins, not enough pins? And in this case, we had seven ejector pins that weren't even necessary. So you just took some money out of the tool right there. Also here, look at ejector pin contact pressure on the part itself. So here is actually just showing you uh, some of the pressure that was put onto the part just from the ejection. And then you can kind of translate that to uh, any type of deformation or strain that might have occurred on the part. So here we have, you know, we have a plot showing you know, your local uh, strain and stress. So animate this. And you can see you know, that during the ejection, it does actually deflect that part up slightly in that area, so, and, or create some stress in that area. So again, something to consider. And then here actually is our uh, displacement. So if we click here, we actually see the actual displacement of the part. So as it gets uh, more orange or yellow, um, it's, it's displacing up in the negative Y direction. Okay. So I'll go back to the, the, the tool design uh, capabilities here. So here's just one example. I took, you know, some components out of SigmaSoft. And you can see we got some mold plates. You can see the cooling lines, of course, in blue. And then uh, the ejector pins were included in the simulation. And then the hot runner manifold, and then even the part uh, inside. Now, I also want to couple this with the multi-cycle we talked about. So if we look at, you know, see cycle one versus cycle 15, now all these ejector pins are going through, you know, mold plates that have cooling lines run through them. But they're also in contact with the part, right, or the cavity when the polymer flows through there. So um, sometimes it can actually make a difference if you want to see, you know, hey, how are these ejector pins actually affecting heat transfer out of the cavity? Uh, so if we look at cycle one, again, everything's one temperature here. After 15 cycles, uh, you can see that the, the pins have a, you know, quite a different temperature distribution. And actually, if we open that mold up, again, everything over here is one temperature. But here, you can see that, yeah, of course the mold cavity is heated up uh, quite a bit after 15 shots of hot polymer. And even that pin specifically is really heated up. And, uh, and again, it's just, you know, being able to capture more of this is going to give you better results. Okay, so multi-component simulation. So I'm not sure how many people uh, on the call today uh, do multi-component. Uh, but we call it multi-component because it's, uh, you know, it, a lot of people might call it just two-shot or even multi-shot. Um, but really, there's no limit to the number of components that we can simulate. So we just call it multi-component simulation. So here, in this case, we have two components that are being injected simultaneously. And then actually, I'm going to stop this. We're going to take 
those components now, so they, you know, they basically were uh, injected, cooled, ejected, all that, and then they were moved over to another molding machine where actually a third material was injected, some of it into the open cavity, some of it actually over molded over this, this outside area. So we're going to watch both of those. And then over here is actually showing the temperature increase as that polymer flows through those areas. And of course, the important thing with something like this is you want to see really the overmolding aspect of this, you know, or the remelt, right? So you have one polymer, or say an elastomer, overmolded over another cold polymer. You know, you need some remelting to occur there, so that so a good bond occurs. Uh, SigmaSoft will tell you that. So there's remelting as a result. So you can look at you know, the adhesion there to make sure that you know, based on what criteria you specify, that yes, you know, we had good adhesion at this temperature over this amount of time. We feel good a good bond was, was done. Then, of course, you take that to the actual process in the real world, and it gives you a nice starting point. And then, of course, the warpage of, of those n number of components, right? So in this case, we have three different components. We can, we can predict the final warpage of all those and what the final part's going to deflect. OK, so similar to that, though, and this is actually more of a shuttle mold situation. So we're actually going to inject polymer into the, the first shot here. But instead of actually ejecting this and letting it cool and then putting it into another process where it's over molded or, co or, or, yeah, or over molded, you can see here the temperature increasing here as, as the part is uh, solidifying. Is that immediately it's actually shuttling over to a second barrel and a second polymer is actually injected into that. So the nice thing here is that you know we can capture that hey you know the actual mold temperature as it moves to that second barrel, the actual temperature of the polymer that was solidified enough to be opened up and then moved over to a second barrel, but it's definitely a lot hotter than it would be if it was actually ejected and you know, sat on a conveyor for you know, maybe 30 minutes or so. So again, uh, another neat capability. OK, so in summary, uh, the ability to simulate all types of polymers. And not only uh, all types of polymers, but we also can do metals, ceramics as well as long as we can characterize the material. And then the consideration of the entire mold and the entire cycle. Uh, but it's not required. So the, the, the takeaway here is that you know, your, your simulation can be as simple as possible. You can bring a part in, run a quick will it fill, is it manufacturable type analysis. Or you can model in the entire mold, the entire setup, and, and consider uh, all, everything that, that might impact uh, the, the process. And then the multi-cycle simulation that I highlighted. And again, can't talk enough about the, the upfront uh, preparation time to actually create a simulation. Um, it's, uh, it's pretty remarkable. And then I mentioned the, the, the accurate thermal solver, again, the ability to assign heat transfer coefficients to eat any component that touches itself, be able to specify if, a, if the polymer sticks on one mold half for a second or two longer than another half. So very detailed stuff in there that you can set up to really capture what's happening in the real world. And then, of course, the stuff I mentioned that happens um, after molding, you know, the, the post-molding simulation. OK, so at this point, um, I guess we're ready to take it to some questions. And uh, so my information is on the screen. So due to the number of people we have on the call today, um, this is pretty typical. So what we're going to do is there's a question window uh, on your uh, GoToWebinar screen. So if you just want to type the question into your window, um, I, I can go ahead and just answer those one-on-one. -on -one. And uh, that should uh, work pretty well. And of course, if you have a question or you don't want to ask it in, the, in, the, in this forum, if you just want to speak to me one-on-one, -on -one, you know, there's my information on the screen, so please don't hesitate to contact me if you'd like to talk about uh, anything further. So let me bring up the window here.